Good morning and welcome as we continue with the second portion of Parshas Noach, Chapter 7. Nothing to do with bankruptcy laws. Even though the entire story of Noach, the entire section of Noach, according to the teachings of Hasidus, is all about the trials and tribulations of making a living, which is, I guess, why this has to do with Chapter 7. Vayomer Hashem Lenoach. God said to Noach, Bo ato v'chol beischa el ateva. Come, you and your whole family, into the ark. Ki because oscha ro'isi, you I have seen, tzaddik as righteous, lefonai before me, badeir hazeh, in this generation. In this generation, you are a righteous person. Noah lived in a very wicked generation. It doesn't say a perfect tzaddik, even though for his time, Noah was a perfect tzaddik. Mikan, from here we learn, that it's appropriate to recite partial praise of a person when he's listening. But his entire praise should be recited, not in his presence. When Hashem speaks to Noach, he says, When Hashem speaks about Noach, he says, Noach, Noach, Ish, Tzadik, Tomim, Hoyobidoroso. He was complete. When he describes Noach, he describes him with a greater uh, praise, a greater compliment than he does when he speaks face to face, so to speak, with Noah. The Rebbe comments on this portion and points something interesting out that as we segue from chapter 6 to chapter 7, we see that chapter 6, if you take a moment to look at Verse 13 in chapter 6, it says, Vayomer Elohim lenoach. God said to Noach, Elohim is the expression of severity. Here, chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Vayomer Hashem lenoach. That's Midas Harachamim, the attribute of compassion. So the Rebbe states that it's very probable that Chapter 6, verse 13, was recited at the beginning of the 120 years. You should build an ark, and this and this and this is what you should do. So that came from the attribute of justice. Here, the flood is about to happen. 120 years later, Hashem is expressing himself with compassion to Noah and his family. That's why here it's Hashem. That's an interesting teaching. Verse 2, what should he take with him into the ark? Mikhail Habehema Hatera from all of the pure or practically speaking kosher animals. Tikach lecha you shall take for you Shiva Shiva seven and seven. What does it mean seven and a seven? Ish Vishte man and wife or male and female. Seven males and seven females, seven couples of every animal, every kosher animal. And from the animals that are unkosher, Shnayim only take a total of two <coughs> instead of a total of 14. Ish, ishte, male and female, or man and wife, so to speak, of the unkosher animals. Rashi, very fundamental <coughs> teaching in Rashi, very well-known, very famous Rashi. Ha-tahora ha-asidim liyastora liyastora. What does it mean, ha-tahora? Those who, those animals which will, in the future, be proclaimed as kosher, as pure, for the Jew to consume. What does Noah have to do with kosher? Noah was ten generations before Abraham, the first Jew, who was many generations before Moshe, 
seven generations before Moshe when the Torah was given. Yet we know that our patriarchs, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob studied Torah, which they knew prophetically before it was given. Here Rashi brings down a famous Gemara in Erevin, Lamadnu, from here we learn from the Talmud in Erevin 18, Shalomad Noach Torah, that Noach also studied Torah. That's interesting. Noach wasn't even Jewish. But Noach was a great tzaddik before there were Jews, just as there were many other tzaddikim, like we're about to learn today about one of the greatest tzaddikim who ever lived, Misushelach, Methuselah. The whole flood was postponed for seven days because he passed away. The world should be able to sit shiva, should be able to mourn him. Noach was not only righteous for his time, but he studied Torah prophetically. That's how he knew which animals were kosher. Actually, again, the Rebbe talks about this, and he points out that as we look into Torah, we see that the signs for kosher animals are they have to have completely split hooves, and they have to chew their cud. It's improbable that Noah took every animal, fed them, and waited to see if they chewed their cud, because it would take them a long time. So he says the fact that he studied Torah in general, the Gemara, he brings down from the Gemara Erevin. Nevertheless, we had to utilize the miracle we learned about yesterday that any animal which was able to enter and to remain in the ark was able to stay in the ark that was divine intervention that Hashem permitted the right animals to be there so Noah didn't really have to give them the complete kosher test to see if they have an OU on them Shiva Shiva Kadesh Yaker Mehem Korban say the simple reason of why he needed 14 of the kosher and only two of the unkosher, is because as we learn at the end of the year, Noah and his family stayed in the ark for a year. At the end of the year, as they came forth out of the ark, they offered sacrifices to say thank God, and they needed kosher animals with which to offer sacrifices. Okay, just uh, another interesting point quickly. Here we find a well-known phrase in this verse too. Umin habehema asher lo tehorahi. And from the animal which is not pure. Now we know how cautious and careful and meticulous the Torah is with every word and every letter. There isn't even one unnecessary word or even an unnecessary letter in the Torah. It would have been a lot easier to say Umin habehemo And from the impure animal. The word hatmeya would replace four words. Asher lo tohorahi. Why doesn't the Torah use the word hatmeya instead of asher lo tohorahi from the animals that are impure? The answer is because the Torah hesitates to speak in negative terms even about an animal. Therefore, rather than say hatmeya, the Torah would rather say asher lo tohorahi, which is not pure. In that case, the question is asked, and the Rebbe discusses this in his talks. In that case, the question is asked, by the laws of kosher and unkosher, we have the word tmeya in abundance. The answer is there we need it for halacha. When you need it for halacha, you've got to say it like it is. Here we're telling a story. When you tell a story, the Torah would rather say that one which is not pure rather than say the one which is defiled or impure. In that case, the Rebbe points out and asks a very powerful question. Why in the very beginning of the portion which we learned yesterday, it says, Eile told us Noach. These are the generations of Noach. Noach ish tzaddik. Noach is a righteous man. And Rashi brings down two opinions. Some of our sages interpret this as a compliment, lishvach, as praiseworthy, that for his generation, that, that Noah was a truly righteous man. Others interpret it in a negative sense, in a critical sense, that only in his generation he was righteous. But had he lived in the generation of Abraham, he would not be considered righteous. Why would the Torah go? Why would Rashi go and choose a teaching of our sages? And why would our sages be critical of Noah? 
We just finished saying we don't want to be critical of anybody. Here you're telling a beautiful story about a beautiful man, and why would Rashi bring down a criticism? Oh, he wasn't really a tzaddik. He was only a relative tzaddik. So again, to cut to the chase, the Rebbe explains that this is not a negative statement. Noach did the very best he could, and he did the very best he was expected to do. And Noach is a tzaddik, unconditionally. In that case, why does Rashi say only for his time he was a tzaddik? Because he only lived in his time. We need to know that we don't stop with the righteous level of Noach. We need to move on to the righteous level of Abraham. Noach didn't live in Abraham's time. For Noah's time, Noah was a tzaddik. But we should not think for a moment that that's enough. We need to emulate not only Noah, but we need to emulate Abraham Avinu. Therefore, the Torah says, Eile told us Noah. Noah ish tzaddik tomim. Noah was a complete tzaddik. Yet we need to know we shouldn't stop by only taking care of ourselves. Or the old Hasidic tradition they tell that in Russia, it was very cold in Russia. There are two ways to warm yourselves up. One way is to go outside and chop wood, bring it inside and kindle the wood stove or the fireplace and make the house warm. The other way is to put a fur coat on. What's the difference? The difference is if you chop wood and bring it inside, everyone in the house is warm. If you put on a fur coat, only you're warm. Noah is a tzaddik in pelts. Noah was a righteous man in a fur coat. He took care of himself and his family. But the rest of the world, they became inundated in the flood. In defense of Noah, no matter what Noah would have done, the rest of the world was not ready to receive from him. In Abraham's time, Abraham was able to accomplish a lot more. These are some of the insights of the Lubavitcher Rebbe in this section of Noah. Verse 3, shiva shiva, also from the birds of heaven, 7-7, seven, seven, Zachar and Akeva, male, female. To keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. Why seven of the birds? Rashi explains, of the kosher birds. And and we deduce that which is not specified, birds, from that which is specified earlier, that it's only the pure, that's seven and seven. What's the purpose of bringing all these animals and birds into the ark? He goes on to say in verse 4, key because, in seven more days, God says, I am about to mamter, cause to rain, Al ha'oretz upon the earth. Arboim yeim v'arboim lo'ila. Forty days and forty nights in the Zohar and in Kabbalah and in Hasidus. We talk about the fact that the number 40 is symbolic of the, four, the measure of 40 sa of a mikvah. That a mikvah, a ritual purity pool, has to have a minimum of 40 sa, that the world was about to take a mikvah. The world was about to experience immersion in a mikvah to purify itself from the impurity of the pre-flood era. That's the symbolism of the 40. O machisi, I will blot out, as kolayukum, every living substance, asherosisi, which I have made, may alpneo adoma from the face of the earth. Rashi, What's the symbolism of another seven days? Meaning that the flood was postponed for seven days. These are the seven days of mourning of Misushelach, the righteous one. Hashem had compassion upon his honor and withheld us, Aparonius, the punishment. Go calculate of the Lifespan shall mishuselach, shall shall mishuselach, of mishuselach, v'sim tzei you'll find shehim kolim that they come to an end. Bishnas sheish meyes shana lachayin noach when Noach was six hundred years old. That's when the flood happened. That's when Methuselah passed on. Who was mishuselach? We take the generations from Adam till Noach. The Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says asora doros 
May Odom ad Noach. There are ten generations from Adam to Noach. Odom, Sheis, Enosh, Kenon, Mahalalel, Yered, Chanoch, Misushelach, Lemech, Noach. Misushelach is Noach's paternal grandfather. And he passed away just at the time when God had scheduled the flood. So in deference to him, God pushed it off for the week of Shiva. Tseva Hashev, go calculate. Oh, we did that. Okay. Okay. Kili Yomim Eid, Mahu Eid, what's the symbolism of Eid? Zman Achar Zman, Zen Nesev Al Kuf Chav Shona, in addition to the 120. Our Boyim Yoyim, Keneged Yitzidus Havlad, a symbolism which Rashi brings down of 40 days, is we're told that it takes 40 days from the time of conception for the embryo to take shape. Because in that era, they were so corrupt with intimacy that everybody was being intimate with everybody, and illegitimate children who are being born in great number. So Hashem says that's part of the symbolism of the 40, the 40 days it takes to begin to form the embryo, which in so many cases was the embryo of a halachic mamzer of an illegitimate child because people were being intimate with other people's spouses or with their brothers and sisters or whatever halachically defines the category of mamzer. Verse 5, Vayas Noach and Noach did kechil asher tzivo Hashem everything that Hashem told him to do. What did Noach do? Five, I asked Noach, ze biyose la teva. This is his entering into the ark. Just another teaching on the heels of the teaching which we talked about yesterday, quoting the Baal Shem Tev, bo el ha teva, that when God says to Noach, come into the ark to escape the floodwaters, that the Baal Shem Tev said that God speaks to each and every one of us that we need to escape and find strength and fortification from the floodwaters of the pressures of day-to-day life, specifically earning a living. So the Baal Shem Tev said we have to enter into the word teva means an ark, it also means a word, into the words of prayer and the words of Torah, that when we enter into the words of prayer and we enter into the words of Torah, it gives us strength to be able to stay strong, that is at the entry level, and that is the meaning of verse 5, that Noah did everything that Hashem commanded him. He entered into the ark. Later we'll learn that God also told Noah, it's time to go out of the ark a year later. And that is that there comes a time when we need to close the Siddur, and we need to close the Gemara, and we need to go out and do what God expects us to do in the world. We can't remain with a siddur all day and all of our lifetime. We can't remain studying all day and all of our lifetime. We're here for a purpose as well, and that is to go out and bring the world to godliness. So that's the service of Bo El Ateva, coming into the word of Torah and prayer, and Tzemin Ateva, and then temporarily setting aside Torah and prayer to go out and work and accomplish that which we're supposed to, even though we're always supposed to have prayer three times a day and Torah, a minimum of every morning and every night. This is one of the teachings of verse 5, that he did everything which Hashem told him to do, including coming into the ark and later going out of the ark. Now the Torah gives us the marker, the chronological marker, when Noach ben Sheshmeyes Shono, Noach was at this point in time 600 years old. The Hamabul Hoya and the flood was Mayim Alaor, it's water upon the earth. Seven by Yavo Noah Hovona be Ishto Nishavona Ito Alateva, and Noah, his sons, his wife, their wives came with him to the ark. Mipne may Hamabul because of the flood waters. Rashi, as we pointed out yesterday, Noah Hovonov, during the year in the ark, men and women were separate, there was no intimacy. Men were separate. Women were separate. Because marital relations had been forbidden. Why? Because the world was steeped in grief. This is not the time for marital relations. Because of the waters of the flood. Here, Rashi brings down, and this is actually a famous Rashi, despite the fact that we said earlier Noah was a tzaddik, 
and he was a complete tzaddik, and he was perfect, and he was terrific, and he was a heck of a guy. Nevertheless, af Noach mikatne amonahoya. Noach himself also had doubts. Because for 120 years, there was sunshine. For 120 years, you know, they, they say these days that people, the, the, the media or, or the weather people over-predict hurricanes in the hurricane season. They're always over-predicting. So what happens, and that's what they say happened in Katrina as well, what happens is they over-predict and over-predict and over-predict that people become immune to it. And they say, nah, nothing's going to happen. Then when the real thing comes, it's like uh, the boy who cried wolf too many times. Noah, 120 years, good morning, he believed the flood was coming, but you know, it kept shining every morning. So Noah wasn't sure. Maimon, he believed, if God says so, it's going to happen. Vena Maimon, he wasn't really sure. So Noah himself didn't enter into the ark until the water pushed him into the ark. Noah needed a push from the water. Nine, shnayim, shnayim, two by two. Bo el el Noach. The animals came to Noach. El atavah to the ark. Zochar and the male and female. Kasher tziva lekimas. Noach has God commanded Noach. Bo el Noach may alayim by themselves. Shnayim shnayim kol and hushu min yezed. They were all equal. Min apokas or shnayim minimum there was two of the kosher animals. There was more than two. Ten by he it came to pass lishivas hayalim at the end of seven days. Or may hamabal hoyu al aris and the flood waters were on earth. Eleven bishnas sheish meyes shona lechaye noach in the six hundredth year of Noach's life. Bachodesh hasheni in the second month. Bishiva also yom lachodesh on the seventeenth day of the month. Interestingly enough, the number seventeen is the numerical value of the word tov, good. Bayom hazeh on this day nivku kol mayonez tohem rabba. All the fountains of the deep waters opened. And the windows of heaven were open. Now there's a running debate, and you should have a handout, which actually has a chart. If we can zoom in on this. We know how to zoom here. On the bottom of the chart we want to zoom. Bottom. All across the page. So here we actually show the chart where there are two theories as to when we talk about first month, second month, third month, whether we talk about the month of Tishrei, the month of Rosh Hashanah, whether we talk about the month of Nisan. And this goes back to a dispute or a discussion as to when the world was created. There's one opinion, as we're learning Rashi, that the world was created, Rabbi Eliezer says. We look in 11 Rashi, Bachodesh Hasheni, Rabbi Eliezer Omer. Rabbi Eliezer says, Zem Mar Cheshvan. This is the month of Cheshvan. Rabbi Eliezer follows the theory that the world was created in Tishrei, hence we have Rosh Hashanah. So the second month is Cheshvan. Rabbi Yeshua Omer, Rabbi Yeshua says, no. He follows the theory that the world was created in Nisan, which is why the months begin from Nisan, and therefore the second month would be Er. So here throughout, we're going to have different charts and different philosophies. Actually, the chart that I just showed you was the chart according to Rabbi Eliezer, which is ultimately the theory that Rashi accepts and follows throughout after he establishes that there is a debate. Nifku lahetzi meimeim, to bring forth their waters. To heim rabba mida keneged mida, measure for measure. Heim chato berabba ro'as odam. Their sin was, quote, rabba, great. Great is the evil of man. Velokup et heim rabba. And their punishment was the great deep waters. Now I want to pause for a moment and share a very important teaching on verse 11. And that is a famous teaching in the Zohar. And many of the chumoshim which follow the teachings of Hasidus bring down this teaching that the Zohar says, based upon the verse in the 
hundredth year, the deep waters gushed forth and the windows of heaven opened, says the Zohar, that in the sixth hundred of the sixth millennium, the underground waters of the deep will open and the windows of heaven will open. And the Zohar says that the sixth hundred of the six thousand, which represents entering into the sixth hundred of the sixth millennium, we find ourselves now in the five thousand seven hundred and seventies. We're talking about 5,500, which enters into the 600, equivalent to the year 1740, just as the year 1940 was the year 5,700, so the year 1740 was the year 5,500. Says the Zohar, written many, many years ago, that in the year 5,500, the beginning of the 600 of the 6th millennium, or in the year 1740, the waters of the deep will open and the windows of the heaven will open, making a prophetic statement that the teachings of technology will burst forth, the sciences, that there'll be the industrial revolution, the technological revolution, which we see more and more today, and the year 1740, it reached a certain height and a certain zenith, and at the same time predicting the spiritual bursting forth of Hasidus and Kabbalah, which is the beginning of the revelation of the great Hasidic masters, all of that began around the year 1740, which helps prepare the world for the coming of Mashiach. Well, we understand that spirituality, Hasidus, Kabbalah, prepares the world for the coming of Mashiach. But what does technology have to do with Mashiach? The answer is everything, because there are so many teachings about messianic times, which we first begin to realize now, as we see the internet, how is Mashiach going to teach the entire world at the same time? He's going to do it on a webcam. <laughs> He's going to do it on the internet. And, and so on and so forth. The evolution of technology tells of the coming of Moshiach and Messianic times. And that is a teaching on chapter 7, verse 11. That's the 711 teaching of Genesis. 12, Vayihi HaGeshem Al HaOretz and the rain came upon the earth, Arboim Yem, Barboim Loila, 40 days and 40 nights. Rashi, Vahiyah Geshem, Alor, Solhau, Noim, Aviyah, Mabul, was it rain or was it flood? Elak, Shehidi, Nareidi, Debarach, when they first came down, the rains came down compassionately. Shem Yachzeru, that if the people will repent, Yil Gishme, Bracha, they'll become rains of blessing. Okshele, Chazu, when they did not repent, Chayula, Mabul, they became a flood. Arboim Yem, Ein Yem, Rishon, Min Aminyan, the first day is not counted because its night is not with it. And if we look at this chart here, we see that on the 17th of Cheshvan, the rain begins. That's the chart. Following Rabbi Eliezer, looking at the chart, the 40 days of rain ends the 28th of Kislev. And Rashi explains... Because there's a question, a Hebrew month, is it 29 days or is it 30 days? Sheha because the calculation says, Nimnin Kisidram, they're counted in order. Echad Mole, 130 days, and 129 days. Hare Yud Beis Mimachesh, so we have 12 days from Cheshman. The Chavches Mikislev. So we have 28th of Kislev is the end of the 40 days, according to this chart. 13. And this chart follows the flow of Rashi. In the middle of this day, Noach, Noach came. Noach and Yefes Noach's sons. Veishes Noach and Mrs. Noach. Oshleishes Neshev, one of his three wives, Etom with them, Elateva, into the ark. 
the Torah teaches us, that is contemporary, said, we dare see him entering into the ark. On Ushaver, may say, we'll break the ark. The Hergen, I say, we'll kill him. Amen. Akadish Baruch Hashem says, really, I dare you. Bring it on. Ani Machnis say, I will bring him in. Leine Kulam before everyone at noon, at high noon. Venida will see. Dvar Miyokam, whose words will prevail. 14. Hema, they, the people, the eight people, there are four couples. Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. The Cholachaya Lamina and all the beasts by their kind. Cholabahema Lamina, those are the wild animals, all the domestic animals by their kinds. Cholaremes and all the creepy things are Remis Alores that creep on the ground. Lemineo by their kind. Cholaif Lemineo, all the birds by their kind. Kol Tzipar Kol Konab, every winged bird. Rashi Tzipar Kol Konab, Dabaku, hyphenated. Tzipar shall call me in Konab, every winged creature that Abbas Chagavim, including locusts. 16, I'm sorry, 15, by Yaveyu El Noach Alateva, they came to Noach to the ark. Shnayim, ta, shnayim two by two, we call Abosar from all flesh, Asher Beru Achayim, which had the spirit of life. The Haboyim and those who came, Zohar Unikeva, were male and female, we call Bosar of every flesh bow, they came, Kashar Tziva Isay Elohim, as God commanded them. By Yizgar Hashem Badei, and Hashem shut them into the ark safely. What does this connotate? What does this teach us? Hagen, all of God, protected him. Shalei Shibrua, they wouldn't break it. Hikif Ateva, God surrounded the ark, Dubim with bears, Varoyas and lions, and they killed some of these people until the message went out. No one is messing with this ark. The simple meaning is Sagar. He closed the door, connected before him in Amayim. Vechein kol ba'ad shavimikah loshin connected. It means in front of. Ba'ad korechem ba'ad decho ba'ad banoich er ba'ad er magen ba'ad yispalo ba'ad avadecha connected avadecha on behalf of your servants. End of today's chumash portion.